the Liqueur Can, and I am a coach and the author of Be Your Number One Chili, though, which has just come out, which I'm super excited about. Um, and that book is all about helping you to be positive, helping you to learn from failure and not let it be devastating or total. Sure, failure sucks, but what I'm here to let you know is it's all a stepping stone in the process of growing and involving uh, transformation. So yes. without further ado, I would love to introduce um, Kiana and ask her loads of questions in this next half an hour for her minutes uh, and see how we roll. So first up, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling fantastic. I'm excited to be here. Um, I sent my husband an email and said, add international speaker to your wife's resume. Right. So I'm really excited about this opportunity to be able to speak with you for sure. Awesome. Okay. So the first question is, tell us a bit about your story, you know, tell us about your background, you know, what do you do and why do you do it? What made you to do that? Got it. Well, I'm going to start with saying I'm Kiana Romeo and I am me. I happen to be a mother, a wife, sister, daughter, aunt, friend, mentor, so many different things. And the reason why I start with that is because oftentimes when we want to answer the question about tell us about ourselves, we immediately want to hop into our professional accolades and our education. And we oftentimes omit the things that are most important. And so that's why I started with that, because those roles are the ones that are most important to me in my day to day life and my decision making and choices that I choose to make. But um, from a professional standpoint, I have over 15 years of leadership experience in both private and public sector organizations. Um, I've led teams from five people to teams of 100. Oftentimes, um, working in a technology and operational space, being the only female, you know, in the room and, you know, had to become accustomed with dealing with that. But I currently work in government affairs for a technology company, and I had the pleasure of leading major projects and initiatives uh, for state and local government agencies to help them meet their technology needs. Wow, amazing. That is a breadth of stuff. Not even to mention, wait, did you tell us about your diversity of action as well? Um, did you say something about my schooling? Your diversity, about your okay. So from a diversity standpoint, so um, I'll tell you a few years ago, uh, out of necessity, I was experiencing some microaggressions in a previous workplace, and I and I was kind of weird for me. I really didn't know how how to what it was, and what was I going crazy or what. And I learned the concept of microaggressions and started doing a bit more research on diversity and inclusion and happened to go and see a speaker by the name of Eric Smith, who was doing a presentation for a major nonprofit in Florida. And I said, hey, I admire the work that you're doing so much. I want to do it. Tell me how, <laughs> right? And, and that's a part of being your own, your number one cheerleader. Like there was a time when I would have not made that ask. I wouldn't have dared walked up to a stranger and said, hey, can I work for your organization? Um, but I did that. And so two years ago, I started working in this space where we work with organizations of varying sizes on their diversity and inclusion efforts and having those courageous conversations with their employees, evaluating policies and procedures and figuring out ways for an organization to not only be diverse, but also inclusive. Wow, that is amazing. That is so, so, so topical, obviously, uh, with the times that we're in, but we'll, we'll come back to that in just a moment. So okay. obviously, you had such like a broad um, career and experience, and it'd be really great to talk about a little bit about like having resilience and what does that mean to you? And like, how have you applied that to the career that you've had so far? Okay, well, definitely, when you're a female in a male dominated space, resilience is key, right? <laughs> because you got to be tough. Um, and so for me, I think it comes down to really identifying or defining like what resilience is, which is the capacity to recover quickly from obstacles or difficulties. And a way to simplify that is really understanding that whether you trip, fall or stumble, that there is this ability to get back up again. And to me, that's what resilience represents, even though you're facing obstacles, figuring out ways to overcome them. And I think um, it started with me with accepting the fact that once that setbacks are going to happen in life. And I think for the first 30 years of my life, I just felt like if you follow the rules and check all the boxes, right, of the American dream, that life will be easy, roses and, and rainbows. And that's not necessarily the case. And so resilience is about being okay with being uncomfortable and uh, using setbacks as a way to really gain wisdom and grow as a person. 
Nice, nice. And do you think there's a particular example that you like to share with us about a time where, you know, you were in a particular like job and you're like, you know what? Oh, that thing really sucked. But I learned so much after like after the year passed. I was like, you know what? Yes, that thing that happened to me, even though at the time I was crushed, it oh. helped me to move forward. <laughs> oh, I have plenty of stories. I may write a book. You, you've been yes. <laughs> and I would, I would always say I'm gonna write a book because there's some things that are happening here that I just can't explain. But no, um, I'll say uh, my first major position, right? Um, I was under 25 years old, managing a team of about 30 people. And um, there were folks within the organization that felt like they should have been awarded that particular position. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. here I am, you know, at a brand new company, the youngest person on the leadership team and leading a group of folks who didn't necessarily welcome me being there, especially because my role was in quality control. So it was about really finding efficiencies in an organization and saying, mm -hmm. hey, we may only need four people instead of five to do this particular work. And for me, it was about um, trying to find common bonds and mutual creating a mutual respect with folks who I was working with and approaching it not as a boss, but as a leader saying, hey, I'm not just telling you to do this work. I want to figure out what obstacles I can help you overcome, right, to help you achieve what, what's important to you. And so for me, um, you know, being young, hired in a male dominated industry, there was you know, times when someone would tell me I should dress up more for work, even though I <laughs> just, you know, little things like that, right? And so, you know, and, and for me, uh, managing emotions is key when it comes to resilience. Not saying that you're not going to experience emotions, mm. but how do you manage them, right? Identifying what your triggers are and figuring out how to navigate through that is key to resilience. Oh, amazing, amazing. That oh, one of my triggers is like someone calling me young lady. Like, don't young lady me, right? Like, excuse me, I don't need you to reference my age nor gender. And so I would find that I would be triggered when someone would call me that because I didn't know where that was coming from. And so really being able to identify your triggers and identify ways to overcome an emotional reaction, whether that's a deep breath or taking a pause, or not writing that angry email. Those yeah, are some things. For sure. <laughs> for sure. Amazing. Well, that leads us on neatly onto the next question because obviously you're talking about emotional triggers and presenting yourself in the, the workspace. So as a black woman, you must have, you know, faced many challenges. You know, do you have any particular moments where you think, oh my gosh, you know, this is not would not be happening to anyone else, but you know, for the fact that I am who I am and, and how I look, um, they are deciding to, you know bring these issues to me for sure I mean that's something that I think women of color right we face because you have the gender and you have race right that you're that you're kind of battling with and so you know I have examples of, of equal pay of sometimes being paid less than my male counterparts which here in the states I'm not sure about in the UK but that's a thing or it's called equal pay day so this year a woman uh, in August 2020 for a black woman that is the day that her pay met on the dollar the pay from a white male from last year, right? So it's almost like you're almost, always eight months behind when it comes to equal pay for the same roles and the same responsibilities. And so, wow. um, you know, there were times when I knew I was not getting paid uh, the same as male counterparts, even though they may have uh, had less employees or less responsibility. And I think it's about really putting together a case. And I put together a case and was able to demonstrate, hey, here are my responsibilities. Here's what the industry calls for. And was bold enough to have that conversation and say, if you want me to accept this promotional opportunity, you're going to have to pay me. And since I know you need me, <laughs> what are we going to do? And so really not being afraid to, to negotiate and ask questions. And I learned early on in life, the answer to a question can only be yes or no. And so if you don't ask, uh, my grandmother would say that closed mouths don't get fed. So you have to ask sometimes. You have to develop your case and go in from a non-emotional standpoint, but present the facts. Mm, mm. so I mean how do you develop the courage because a lot of people were like you know I, well, one how do you develop the courage but two how can I present the case like can you give us some examples of things that, like how you gathered your evidence to like go to that meeting where you're going to negotiate because I think that'd be great to share with everyone of course 
Well, the, the courage is a mindset thing, right? Like asking myself, and sometimes we can be our biggest critics, which that's why I think your book is so important because oftentimes, especially women in leadership, we can encourage and coach our friends and our peers or even strangers on the street, right? But the way that we talk to ourselves or our self-talk is so negative and so contrary to, to reality because we can be our biggest critics sometimes. And so for me, developing the courage was about really being able to examine where, what I'm strong at, not allowing blind spots like my weaknesses to um, overtake me or give me a false sense of security. And, um, you know, we just started with doing the research. Well, what are other people in this industry with this level of responsibility? What does their compensation look like, right? And, and doing that kind of research, comparing um, other departments that had roles that were similar to mine and, and really being able to utilize a portfolio of my work that I created to really demonstrate how I was able to save the organization money, right? And so if I'm able to save you millions of dollars through a process change or a new technology acquisition, well, a lot of times with companies, those dollars and cents, that's a good way to be able to say, well, why would a 10K raise or a 20K raise be something that we can't consider for an employee or a team member who has been able to bring this sort of savings or efficiency to the organization. So really, you got to know your stuff. You got to know what you've contributed. If you are not keeping a portfolio of your wins, I would suggest that you do that because it's not really anyone else's responsibility to do that, right? And giving yourself credit when you have a win. I think sometimes we'll have major projects and really want to acknowledge like the resources and the time and the effort that went into that project. And hence, when it's complete, we move on to the next thing without celebrating the wins. And a part of celebrating the wins for me is throwing it in my file, right? When you get that, that great email from the vice president on what a great job you did, just throwing it in my Kiana file on my email. And, you know, when it comes down to evaluation or asking for a pay raise or, to be reconsidered for a position, I use my work as a reflection of what I bring to the organization. Nice, that is really good. And that really helps people to get a structure towards that thing. But I wanna ask you just to like um, develop on that. Do you have a particular like um, phrase or like sentences that you use to know that you, you wanna keep firm in you know, believing in your wins and not backtracking to, oh, I assisted. I, I helped to make that saving, but it wasn't totally me. <laughs> you know, and that's so funny because we'll do that, right? As women, we'll say, well, as a part of the team, it kind of reminds mm -hmm. me like your projects in college where there's the one person that does the majority of the work, but then there's four folks that get credit for it. And what I find sometimes in the workplace is the folks who haven't necessarily done the heavy lifting seem to have no issue with taking credit, right? And so my little mantra to myself is to maximize the moment and um, when the opportunity or time presents itself for me to share uh, a project or an initiative that's been successful, like really being strategic in whom I share that with, um, you know, having an elevator speech develops depending on who I may run into, right? Um, all those things kind of go into play. But really for me, my mantra is maximize the moment. Like how am I going to maximize this moment for my my physical, personal, spiritual career gain? Like how, how do I make this into something that will equate to a uh, return on the investment of time? Mm, okay, this is, I love this. So one final question before we move on, and that is like, how do you mind your feelings about like possible rejection? Because you, you're not certain that you're gonna get what you want. Yeah, and rejection hurts, it does. And I think it starts with, Sometimes uh, we'll experience rejection and we'll downplay it and we won't really allow ourselves to feel, right? And so for me, it's about um, allowing myself to, to feel the rejection and acknowledge that this hurts, right? And then saying, okay, well, what am I going to do now? Like, okay, so, um, and, I, and thankfully this has not been my experience recently, but I think about one of the first jobs that I applied for right out of college. I didn't get the job and I was so hurt by that, right? And I had a little pity party, but then I decided, mm -hmm. okay, well, what's next? Well, that's what I think is going to be key. It's, it's really being able to affect that mindset. That's key. 
Amazing, amazing. Now let's just whip back to that your work on diversity and inclusion and think about like all that's happened with, you know, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and all the unjust things that we've seen in America and internationally, not, not just in America. Um, you know, so what I want to ask you about is like how can companies who are forward looking and want to embrace diversity and inclusion like have the courage to have those difficult conversations um, with their employees about, you know, what does that mean for the company? That's good. That's a great question. One, I think it starts with acknowledging that there's been too many names, right? Like you've named a couple that have occurred here in the States, but there's so many more. Sandra Bland, Freddie Gray, like the list goes on and on and, the, and it has to stop, right? But what I find, um, one of the first things that when we were having these conversations um, in the heat of the summer of 2020, there were certain people, no matter what field that they were in, whether it was higher education or corporate, or folks would just say, no one's asked me how I'm doing. I would have, you know, black clients that would say, no one's asked me, like with everything that's going on in the world, no one has asked me how I'm doing. I think it starts with that. Mm -hmm. Like taking a sincere personal interest in your employees and, um, Although maybe prior to 2020, talking about race in the workplace was something that could be avoided, but at the height of the summer, you had to say something. And I think there were many organizations that rightfully so came out and made diversity statements about um, their stance on racial inequalities and injustices. But the second step is putting your money or your actions or your resources where your mouth is, right? And I think um, organizations need to really focus on having an inclusive workspace model, right? Not just focus on diversity, but inclusive. Do people feel included, right? Not just have you check the, the boxes of what diversity means. And diversity is not only focused on gender and sex. It could be ba based on millions of other things like religion, other preferences. And so I think it's also important to ask yourself as a company, does your executive team portray diversity and inclusion? Mm. If your executive team does not mimic or reflect your workforce, well then why is that, right? We gotta ask ourselves that question because it's important that Back, people from various backgrounds have a seat at the table and are able to make some policy decisions and influence the organization's direction. And so I think your executive team certainly should reflect diversity and inclusion. I think small things that you can start with is just really acknowledging multiple religious and cultural practices, not just taking um, the viewpoint of it's Christmas and Christmas alone, but what are some other religions, right, and other cultural celebrations that if we're going to do that as a company, that we're being inclusive, right? And when you think about it, the amount of money that it takes to onboard and train an employee, you're, you're going to come out better on from a bottom line perspective when you're including diverse mindsets and opinions, but you're also going to save money because you're not going to be going through this cycle of hiring and rehiring people because they're not happy or they don't feel included as a part of the workforce. Yeah, no, I mean, for sure, for sure. So I just want to keep that theme and ask, you know, like if you are like a woman of color or a woman in general, and you feel like you want to be able to approach, you know, your colleague or a senior member of, of staff um, at your company to you know, talk about um, these issues like how would you suggest like they approach it in the first place and the second thing is if they want to like actively like have some kind of group like what would you suggest that they, they do to help that you know be become, um, a grassroots of things in the company and the company actually um, take that thing on board and not just be like a side thing that people just trying to like you know push by themselves yeah because that happens sometimes for sure I think um, depending on your position within the organization uh, trying to find an ally that is a key decision maker would certainly assist you in championing a process or a project such as bringing on a diversity or inclusion efforts within an organization but really examine company culture with the leadership team and ask yourselves the question is every voice welcomed? Is every voice heard? Is every voice respected? And if the answer is no to any of those questions, that's where you start, right? That's where you start. Is it an issue of folks not being heard? 
people not being respected or they're not even being included as a part of the conversation. And so I would start with, uh, if you know, if I had a lower position within an organization, finding an ally in leadership and, and having that conversation and asking them their opinion. And then going back to the dollars and cents and demonstrating how companies that have women on their boards or have a diverse workforce, how they're able to really experience financial gain in comparison to their counterparts that don't. And um, what you described was an affinity group. So anyone can start an affinity group and it can be based off of folks that like to play softball or black women within an organization or um, Hispanic men. Those, those are called affinity groups. And I think oftentimes affinity groups aren't always considered by companies, but it's a great way to help build community within an organization. And I've worked for some large organizations that have had uh, black leadership affinity groups where I had the opportunity to meet with and exchange ideas and talk with people that happen to look like me, right? Who had similar experiences. And I've been able to gain great mentors through affinity groups, uh, lifelong connections, but also wisdom on how to navigate through what's considered the corporate leadership ladder um, through having a place called like that's considered home, which is that affinity group. And in regards to the affinity, group, affinity groups, do you think that um, a person from HR should be a member or they should just be invited to you know, attend at certain meetings? I think, I think it could be both, depending on the organization's culture and how HR is viewed, because that, you know, that view can vary from organization to organization, whether it's private or nonprofit or um, a corporate culture. I do think that you have to have um, sponsorship and acknowledgement through HR, because that's showing that the company has really brought into it and that we're not just letting them those folks play over in the sandbox, but we have some actionable goals. What, what do we want? Do we want to increase diversity hiring? Do we want to ensure that there's diversity on the board of directors? Like it's important that we're not just meeting for the sake of meeting, but that there's some actionable things that are expected to come out and really to be able to measure the group's success. Are we focused on uh, reskilling or retooling employees to be successful in the new workforce, right? And so in order for it to be successful, I think there should be some, some measurable goals that are attached to that affinity group as well. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you a controversial question. So what I see. Is, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm warming you up for this one. So, you got me in the hot seat, yes, I have. No, no. Okay. So like, uh, obviously like people have been reacting to what's been happening out there. Um, mm -hmm. and I've heard stories and you may have heard stories too. So it might not be so controversial, but what if you are the lonely black woman, the lonely woman, the lonely okay, person who is impassioned by what is happening out there and you put your hand up in your company and you get shouted, shouted down. Like what, 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 do you, what do you do with that? That's that, So to me, that means I need to ask myself some, some tough questions, right? Like one, should I, can I be in this space? Like is this, am I going to be able to experience growth in an organization that does not acknowledge the fact that there are different mindsets or that diversity is required? And so I'd be asking myself some tough questions, but I wouldn't say quit your job, right? Like I would not say that. What I would say is there are different opportunities to share your gifts and talents in different arenas. So in the case where your workplace will not acknowledge diversity and inclusion, but you want to do that work, or is there a nonprofit organization that you can volunteer with, right, that, that um, speaks to that part of you? Are there things that you can do within your church to help build bridges? And so I would say, even if you can't make it work in the workplace, there are some ways to be able to still fulfill that within you. And I would look to those other connect community connections to see how you can use your voice, even if you can't use it in your workplace, because there's going to be some companies that will not. And supremacy will continue to be in organizations. But it's all about how you choose to receive it, if you allow it to push you down or use it as a momentum to push you forward. Mm, no, that is some really brilliant advice, though, because uh, I've heard about the people like saying, I'm the lady voice. I feel like so like depressed and I, I don't know what to do with that. Like I put my hand up. I was brave enough. And then it was had slapped down. So now I'm like, this is where I work. So it's very mm -hmm. awkward, but uh, I got to carry on and right. find a way to like <laughs> move forward. 
Exactly, exactly. And, and I mean, folks, you know, your no one knows your company culture better than you, right? And there may not be space for that type of dialogue in your organization. And are you okay with that? Can you can you be successful? Can you work? Can you thrive in that type of environment? And if the answer is still yes, then I'd say figure out ways to use your voice in other arenas. But if the answer is no, then perhaps there is a bit of soul search that needs to happen to determine if there is an organization that better aligns with your your personal values. Because I think there was a time when people would say, you know, it, there's different buckets. There's a personal bucket, a career. That's not true. Like we bring ourselves to work every day. I can't take off my skin. I can't, <laughs> you know, change my gender. It's who I am. And, and I think the older I've gotten, the more important that has become being with companies and in spaces where my voice is not just tolerated, but celebrated. Mm, amazing. Amazing. That leads us to the next question about growth mindset. So tell us what that means to you. Oh, it's a state of mind. It's mm-hmm. certainly a state of mind. And I think I spoke earlier about the fact that uh, oftentimes we're toughest on ourselves, right? And for me, growth is about getting rid of, rid of what I call stinking thinking, right? And it can get you at the worst time, but we're so tough on ourselves. It's like, I wouldn't even allow a stranger to talk to myself this way. But then why is it a fifth me to talk to myself this way? It's not okay. And so um, I look at growth mindset as really being able to take on challenges and being willing to stretch yourself, um, being okay with criticism and understanding that everyone's not going to always agree with you. But if there's one little nugget that I can take from someone's criticism to help me grow as a person, well, then I've still grown, right? And um, I also allow myself to be inspired by others' success, but I only compete with me. Like, I don't compete with anyone else. And, and for me, that's that's an important aspect of growth as well. For sure, for sure. So also, let's talk about, like, you know, what it feels like to fail and, like, how if in the growth mindset, you know, you're like, if failure happens, change happens, we have to we have to adopt, but it's not, like, a total devastating thing. Like, how have you found that you've, like, adjusted, like, to, you know, failure being a part of the, you know, the, the process and not, like, this whole thing where, like, it's devastation and, like, we have to just, like, get rid of it. And it's a shameful thing, you know? Uh, I mean, I think you hit on this in the book, right? Like you mentioned that there were times when if you mentioned the number of startups that you had and Mm. that they failed, like how that would be a thing. And I think like, I don't want to age myself, but in this like social media world, we're always only showing the best things that happen to us on social media or on LinkedIn that we don't really present the true totality of life because it's ebbs and flows, it's ups and downs. And I'd say um, that there have been times when I failed in life and it's not always easy, but I think accepting the failure, right? And for me trying to be reflective, well, is there anything that I could have done differently? Because sometimes that is the case, right? And really being able to evaluate my decisions or my contribution to the failure, um, what I could have done differently, but, but then taking those as lessons and putting those in my back pocket for when I move forward, because the goal is to try to pass the test, right? Not to keep reliving the same failures over and over again. That's not growth. Like it's okay to fail, but if we keep doing the same thing over and over again, we may need to readjust something because that in itself is insanity if we're doing the same things and expecting a different outcome. But failures happen and that's life and that's okay. And I'm not afraid to tell people when I failed either. Like it's a part of my story. And so, like, just to keep with that theme, like, how do you feel about, like, the sting of it? Like, how do, how do you, like, you know, how do you kind of think, okay, yeah, it sucks, and, you know, I don't feel great about it, but, you know, I'm not going to be like, okay, this is, like, so horrible that I can't tell anyone, and if I ever want to do anything again, like, you know, no one must know that this happened. Like, how do you get into that, that mindset where you're like, you know what, okay, I need a moment to be like, oh, okay, that was bad. And it did not get well because we have to right. admit that. And then be like, okay, you know what? But have the time and and the the, the the clarity to be like, how can I think through what did actually go right? Because it's it's that 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 you know between the the, the, the drop of the like the, the devastation and then the mm-hmm. the time to actually you know not just let it go but to let it go and to think about what actually happened there and how can I actually you know move from this like you know fruitfully. 
Right. So it starts with acknowledgement, like allowing myself to feel the disappointment, which sometimes we don't, especially because like there's this, um, I'm not sure if it's this way in the UK, but like a notion of a strong black woman, right? Where we're just strong all the time and we never experience, that's not true. <laughs> and that will kill you. Like there's no way that, I mean, literally, if you're trying to be everything to everyone, but not allowing yourself to feel any pain, or any disappointments because you're so strong. Good. That's that leads to stress. That's not that's not growth at all. That's that's uh, a fixed mindset in my opinion. And so for me, it's about okay, the failure has happened. If do I need to cry? Do I need to vent to my mom or my sister? Do I need to scream? Right? Like, what do I need to do? Allow myself to go through that, but realizing that that cannot be the forever that cannot be the end of the story right because I feel like every day that we get up it's a new day I really literally feel like every day is a new day to do something so if I'm awake and I happen to I'm waking up alive then there's something for me to do and I really own that like I think it's key um but accepting the failure but then moving on and figuring out what's next because if you're not growing if you're not moving I really feel like you're not living Mm, mm. so then while we just finish up this little segment so is there anything that you'd like to, to add to your your growth mindset attitude like a tip that you, you share with people to help them to like get in that way that they're more of a fixed mindset kind of person someone who was as used to adapting and changing and trying to like you know get on with a more flexible relationship with this failure right be willing to accept challenges be willing to accept obstacles but then ask yourself, well, what's next? Like, what is next? And there, and you've seen people who choose to live in that, right? They're like inherently negative. They always see things from a dark perspective. But is that growth? Is that happiness? Is that peace? And to me, the answer is no. And so you accept it, you feel the pain, and then you figure out, you ask yourself some tough questions to figure out, okay, what's going to be next? yeah for sure because actually sometimes like living in the pit of negativity it takes more time and energy <laughs> and people like that drain me like i don't even want to hear it like i really just don't even want to hear it and not saying you can't be a good friend right if someone's going through something to take that uh, but if it's always negative like i've just got to the point honey where i, I just can't do it like we're, we're gonna have a let's let's figure out how to see the sunshine in this let's figure out how to grow from this that's what it's for all sure. about for sure like mm -hmm. we need to take a moment as we, we've, we've discussed but you know it have to be a brief moment and then we move on to like <laughs> yeah, keep living right because if not how are we gonna eat right like what well, what are your priorities here and I, I, but but i do believe it's okay to have a little pity party or you know <laughs> go through that emotion but then it's pick yourself back up and let's figure out what's next and um and that really leads me to making sure that what are you doing from a spiritual standpoint like I mean for me meditation has been good for me right and praying um are you doing any physical activity like though there's so many things that you need to be doing um in order to stay on that path of growth and it's not just uh getting certifications or getting high paying positions Mm -hmm. I'm gonna throw another one into the mix so like what helps you to like um you know not worry about perfection and put yourself out there boldly and be imperfect because sometimes you're gonna make a mistake yeah I make them I all the time <laughs> me too but I own them like it, it happened and it's not to say that I have low expectations for myself or I'm like oh I failed haha -ha, like that's like mm -hmm. no I, I you know I want to win but I think um experiencing failure help me get over this notion of perfection right but you got to do the work like I had to really figure out what's important to me because a lot of times you live life based on what is important to everyone else like how your parents are going to feel or your spouse or your children so I got was able to get over perfection when I one was able to like rediscover what my priorities were right and something that may be a 10 or your top priority for me may not be my top priority for myself and um but I'd say for the first 30 years of my life honey I was very much so stuck in in this spin of perfection and um I just find that you're on a rat race, like you're on that little wheel for the hamster. You're gonna keep turning and turning. You'll never be able to, to really achieve that. 
Um, but do I have goals for myself? Absolutely. Um, do I have high expectations for myself and my loved ones? Absolutely. But do I expect perfection? No. Mm, mm. because sometimes like in that desire for perfection you know it leads to procrastination and inaction and not actually going for your goals and your dreams and then regret and then horrible negative feelings um it's a cycle and it just happens over and over again right and i think you talked about that in your book too you talked about like um just staying in that research stage forever right yeah. or just not look at so much data it's like okay <laughs> You got to go. You got to make a move. You got to make the decision. It's time. It's time. But we're not always taught that as kids, right? Uh, to critically think. Um, sometimes folks always have an answer for you. And so I think it really asking yourself some basic questions, some open-ended questions to get to the bottom of where your priorities are and, and letting go of perfectionism because it will drive you crazy. I'm convinced of it. Mm, mm. and one final question on this topic which, which is how can you like spot those negative like thoughts in your mind and how can you like challenge them because I think all the times that you know we're quite used to like how we think and we think that we're thinking okay most of the time we think we feel like we're mainly positive but sometimes it takes someone else to be like you know what hey Karen, do you realize that like 50% of the things you say um have a, a down inflection upon you do, do you know mm -hmm. that <laughs> yeah. yeah it happens all the time and you know what the, the transparency is key because I can say, you know what, I'm a business coach, I help people with projects, I lead teams, but I would not be being honest if I didn't say that sometimes I can be critical of myself, right? Um, and that can be in the form of not being able to receive a compliment. You that ever happen to you where someone will say, oh, you look yeah. great, and you're like, oh, my hair is a mess, yeah. or I need to lose weight, or then and then, right? Like all that negative self-talk self that we, we do to ourselves constantly. Um, but for me, it has to become intentional. So really acknowledging the fact that I am with myself more than anyone, right? I hear my voice more than I hear anyone else's. And especially as you do this work, when it comes to diversity and inclusion or coaching professionals, you're really teaching other people how to be more positive in the way they speak to themselves. And so it holds me accountable to be aware of that too. And when it happens, and if I get called out on it, I can acknowledge it. So if you compliment my top and I say, oh, well, I need to lose a few pounds. And you say, well, the top looks great. I'll stop myself right there and say, you know what? Thank you for that. You know, thank you for helping me correct my negative self-talk. But it comes with um, really being honest with yourself and allowing yourself to hear your voice. Yeah. And, and, and saying to your, asking yourself, am I kind to myself? Like, I'm kind to me first. Right, because everyone's not kind to themselves. And I'd say now that is imposter syndrome because it starts with you. Yeah, 100%, you have to be kind to yourself and you have to challenge the voices in your mind and not take them as fact. You have to ask yourself, is that really a fact? Because you, you know, you're just so easy, you're so like used to listening to yourself and you might even want to ask yourself, would my best friend say that about me? And then think, oh no, then say that's not right. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Right. And your best friend knows you, you know, yeah. very well. Or I'll say to myself, would I allow someone else to talk to me like that? Oh, no, I would not. So then why would I do that to myself? And a lot of times when I'm speaking with folks, that's one of the questions that I'll ask. Like, you know, you seem to be very hard on you. Do, do you allow your friends to talk to you this way? Is that OK? And if not, let's kind of work through some of those things. Let's ask ourselves some pertinent questions to get to the bottom of that. But affirmations are key. Like I have a little affirmation. I think it's called I am on my Apple watch. And it's just a little oh, app cool. that I go to. Yeah. And so I, I really believe in affirmations and I'll just Me say them out loud. Yeah. I'll say them out loud to myself and I'm not crazy, but I am um, owning the fact that words have power and I want to affirm myself with positive things. That is beautiful. That's really awesome. Yeah, I mean, I'm a fan of affirmations. I like to like write them and stick, stick them up. Yeah. Um, sometimes I like to hear them too. So let us just um, quickly um, end with, um, you know, you read the book. Is there any key insight that you'd like to share? <sighs> the book was so good. I'm like, if I'd have had the book 10 years ago, <laughs> like I'd be so much further in life. <laughs> <laughs> um, but to me, the best part of the book was the transparency, like, 
You sharing your journey, which I think that your idea would be great to implement right now because there's a need in the market. But um, transparency is key. Really addressing and tackling imposter syndrome, right? Um, and acknowledging that we all fight that. That was one of the major things for me, like the resilience in that and really being able to figure out ways to uplift ourselves and turn that around and seeing how we can help our community or the people that are around us. For sure. We need to like cheer for ourselves and for our community and our best friends. Absolutely. So, you know, and if, exactly. you, if they're not doing that, you need to ask yourself, do you really have friends? <laughs> like, <laughs> they should exactly. be encouraging you for sure. Yes, yes, they should be. And if they're not, maybe you need to be finding a new crowd. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. I agree. No, because sometimes, you know, you get so used to a certain kind of crowd and certain thoughts in your mind that you don't notice until, you know, you meet someone else and you're like, oh, this is not how I want to be. I actually want to like grow and I need to find more people who are in that space uh, or ahead of me that are, you know, you know, thinking the things that I want to think, who are saying the things that I want to, you know, get hold of and who are making the progress that I'm seeking to make. You know? exactly exactly I say to my kids well who's the rabbit in the class like chase that person right and so I surround myself with people from varying backgrounds at different places in their lives and some folks are right where I'm at some people are going through things that I've already gone through and some people are folks that I aspire to and I think it makes sense to have a well-rounded group of folks in your tribe right because it's a give and take I'm giving to those who are coming behind me, but I'm taking and receiving wisdom and knowledge um, from those who I have as mentors or, you know, as personal cheerleaders. Oh, amazing. Okay. So let us wrap it up. And let's, before we um, wrap it up, you know, um, is there anything that you want to share with us about what you're up to? And of course, tell us how to keep in touch and follow you on your great adventures. This is worth inclusion. This is very important in this day and age. Well, I appreciate that. Um, diversity and inclusion has always been important. And I would mm -hmm. say, I would challenge you if there are not efforts going on in your company or conversations being had around this topic right now to, um, work to figure out how to gain the courage to be that voice. And there's a way to do that. Uh, I'm available on LinkedIn, Kiana Romeo, and I'm working on some things for female empowerment as well right now, just to um, continue to be a cheerleader for those who are around me. And we oftentimes assume people that are in leadership positions don't have problems or don't need encouragement. That's not the case. We all need each other to be our cheerleaders. Amazing, amazing. So if they reach out, they can find out more about the empowerment stuff. It's going to be online. Is it going to be global? Like, tell us more. We're excited about that one. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> well, right now, um, we were working on developing a women's conference. It was kind of in play prior to COVID. We put things on mm -hmm. hold because of what's happening. I'm trying to look at what that will look like next year, if we will be able to be in person or if it'll be something that we'll try to do um, via Zoom or another online platform so that we can have a global audience. Um, but bridge-key.com is the website and um, we're going to be working to really get things moving and continue to figure out how we can encourage and empower each other okay and just one final question um, do you yes. have any particular recommendations of like resources or links for people who want to explore diversity and inclusion more um you know both from the us and a uk standpoint Yes, um, there is a program called Courageous Conversations and a lot of, and I'll tell you, a lot of diversity and inclusion training and certification is very expensive, but Courageous Conversations is an opportunity to participate in a small one-on-one -on -one <clears throat> version of group coaching discussing um, diversity and inclusion. And I would say start there and that's a great organization that will help you and empower you to have courageous conversations that ultimately will lead to employee development or affinity programs or other things for your organization. Oh, amazing. Well, with that, thank you so much, Kiana. It's been an amazing um, almost hour. We have learned about your story. You have shared about oh, so many great tips. And it was fun. You know it was that? fun. It was fun. The time flew by, but I, it's just been a pleasure. And I just applaud you for what you're doing. Continue the good fight. We need you. We need to hear your voice. I'm looking forward to part two. Oh, thank you. Well, 
have a great day, everyone. And see you soon. Take care all. Thank Bye. you. Bye.